Welcome to Short Circuit of Brewers. Our channel is about electric brewing. We do electric system brew days, product reviews, and how-to or instructional videos just like this one. In this video, we'll take a look at a simple electric brew in a bag system right after this. A disclaimer before we get started with all of the items that are needed for this build, I wanted to stop and tell you that I am not a licensed electrician. This is not electrical advice. You should always consult your building codes. And if you don't know what you're doing, hire a licensed contractor to do any electrical work for you, which is also highly recommended. I think it's just a given that this whole system be put on a GFCI uh, power circuit so that if there's any kind of liquid that contacts any of the electricity that the circuit shuts off completely. I also want to give a special thanks to Doug from Homebrew Talk for providing me with the circuit uh, diagram for this system. Really appreciate your help and I'll put a link below to the Homebrew Talk thread where I'll post a picture of that circuit as well. In the first part of our electric brewing series we talked about what electric brewing was, what some of the components were, and some of the general knowledge that you needed to start electric brewing yourself at home. Now we're going to take a closer look at what it will take for you to get started electric brewing on one of the simplest systems that I know of, which would be the electric brew in a bag system. All right, so one of the first things that we want to talk about in this system is your choice of kettle. Whether it is the 10 gallon kettle or the 15 gallon kettle, I made the same choice between the two as there are a couple of features to them that I think make them ideal for brewing a bag. So the kettles that I chose were the Bayou Classic and they come with the stainless steel basket that holds the brew in a bag bag off of the bottom of the system and there is a lip on the top of the kettle that holds that basket up and then that keeps it off of the element because these kettles indicate that there's three inches of space underneath of the basket. So I think those are good for that. The basket gives you a way to pull the brew in a bag bag inside of the basket out of the kettle so you can drain it, do your sparging or whatever you want to do. So that is the first main component of the system. If you don't have, uh, if you already have a kettle and you want to add a false bottom to it, you can certainly do that. Um, I'm listing a lot of parts from brew hardware. If they have some false bottoms, it would work for that. You could also maybe use a, uh, cooling rack from a cooking store that's all stainless steel to protect the bag from the element in the bottom. So the next thing that you're going to need in that system is going to be the element and I chose a 5500 watt ripple element that's all stainless steel. I think that's very important so that you don't have any rusting or corrosion later. Um, for that element there's an element enclosure then there's also a I figured eight feet of wiring of 10-3 gauge wire for the element wire to go from the element enclosure itself to your panel and you might check and see how many feet you're going to need of that and maybe order a foot or two more because you can use some of that wire inside of your panel for powering the element from the inlet port to the element switch and then on to your element your SSR and then onto your element so that would be something to consider there. Um, next is the plug for the control panel end of that element uh, wire after that, you're going to need uh, a dip tube because of the fact that the Bayou Classic kettles don't come with any ports or anything like that. So I selected a weldless dip tube and it's a very short uh, dip tube. And I like that because it does create the ability to draw the wart out of the kettle very close to the side. So if there's any trub, um, it can be left in the center of the kettle. So that certainly helps. An optional item is a sight glass. I personally like sight glasses on my kettles just so I can kind of see what's going on during the brew day. If you want to etch some numbers into the side of the kettle on the inside and use that or use a mash paddle with marks on it, you could certainly do that to save yourself some money. Um, you're going to need a ball valve as well and you'll also need a brew in a bag bag. Um, I chose a very simple economical option. There are other options that you can use um, with the basket in there. Uh, I think that the economy one will probably work to start with because of the fact that you have a way to pull that bag up out of the system. 
one of the other items you're going to need for it is going to be a pump and a hose kit. I, I selected a hose kit for this particular build because Brew Hardware has a complete kit that really takes a lot of the confusion out of what fittings you need, how many of them you need. I know whenever I was building my system, I ordered all my fittings, all my hoses, and then when I got everything, I'm like, oh no, I'm missing one particular piece that I need to connect all the kettles and everything together. Mine was a little more complex because it's a three vessel system, but the kit that comes from Brew Hardware, I think is worth the money. It's worth the, you know, not having to worry about what parts you need and what pieces you're gonna get. There are a couple of extra pieces you need uh, on top of that, and I've got those listed there. There's, uh, I'm using a cam lock system, and there's a couple of fittings that you need. One for on the other side of the ball valve, and then the other one is for whenever you bring the tubing back up to the top of the kettle for your recirculation. I've got a hose barb up there where you can attach an extra piece of silicone hose to that to create kind of your whirlpool effect inside the top of the kettle to do your mashing. And then there is a connector on top of that that the cam lock system will fit into. And that's pretty much the kettle itself. Um, if you have a kettle already, you can certainly adapt some of the principles and some of the items that I've listed over to that kettle and make that work for you in the brew in a bag system. So now on to the panel. So what I chose there was the Auber Instruments enclosure that has a single DIN or a single square hole in it. And I chose the one with the heat sink. You can have a, you have a couple options there. You can choose the one for a single 40 uh, amp SSR, or you can choose one that has connections for both. Um, if you're looking to upgrade into a larger system after you try the brew in a bag, it might be worth it just to go ahead and spend the extra little bit of money to go ahead and get the heat sink for the two SSRs because you would be able to run two elements, two, S, you know, two SSRs in there. Part of the components that are for the system would be the panel power plug, and that varies based on what type of power you're gonna be using for the system. If you want to eliminate that plug, you certainly can by wiring the power cord directly into your panel. You're gonna need some bus fuse holders for pump and PID protection. Uh, pump switch options are push button or toggle. It's kind of your choice. The ones I have listed and shown are the ones that have the illumination to them. Um, you can either, the push button one is illuminated as well as the, the toggle switch. Um, you're gonna need an element power switch. And this is a 30 amp two pole switch that's much like a switch in your house, but it will definitely work for this build. Um, if you don't wanna do that, you can do some toggle switches with, connect, with contactors. But for this purpose of this build, we're just using a simple power switch. The next element in the system is the weldless RTD probe with the XLR connector for the, from the probe to the panel. I think it's a good idea to choose that option. I think it's about $12 extra for that option because it does provide you with some protection of the cable. It comes in a steel mesh cable and it allows you to connect your kettle to the control panel with an XLR connector, which is kind of a nice option. And then there is the Easy Boil PID, which is the Kind of brains of the operation again. The one that we chose for it was the Easy Boil PID. They did not have that PID whenever I built my system. I certainly would have chosen it and I may actually look at upgrading mine and do a video on that. But that PID can actually be set so that it brings the liquid to near boiling temperature at full power and then when it reaches 200 degrees or whatever temperature you specify, it can back down the power to a percentage of whatever you choose in the, in, the pro, in the PID itself. Once the system reads that the temperature of the wart is at boil, it will actually start a timer that you specify the time on and it will boil for a certain length of time, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, whatever you specify, and then it'll actually turn it off. So it's kind of a way to automate the boil process as far as time goes. Um, you have the, after that, you have the 40 amp SSR you have a 240 volt element indicator lamp. That's a very important note there that you wanna make sure you select the 240 volt element lamp, not the 110 or 120 volt element lamp because it won't, the 110 element lamp won't work in the system the way we show the wiring diagram. And then you have a element power plug and that pretty much completes all the items in the control panel itself. Now let's look at the way the panel, the way it's wired, the way everything's gonna operate. So our panel design, assumes that whenever you plug it into the wall, you're gonna be ready to brew. There's no interconnect switch. There's no power switch to turn the panel on and off. So 
Okay, so looking at the panel operation, assuming that your strike or mash water is ready to heat up for mash in, the basic operation of the panel is when the power for the panel is plugged in, the power supplied to the system, the power of the ground, the neutral circuits flow through the system, providing power to the element switch, the pump switch, and the PID. Now when the PID receives power, it begins to read the temperature probe and starts to send a signal to the SSR based on what the most recent setting of the PID was. Um, one important thing is before you turn the power on or plug the panel in, that the element switch is off, otherwise you run the risk of dry firing the element, possibly causing damage to it. So after you've got the power to the system, you turn on the pump switch, and the pump switch turns on power to the pump and begins recirculating the liquid through the system. So then when you flip the switch to the element, it powers up one side of the element and then sends power to the other side, the other side of the power to the SSR, and then that begins to send power to the element based on what the settings are on the PID. When the PID tells the element to fire, it'll send power to the element and then also completing the circuit, sending power to the, to the light or the indicator lamp. So that's kind of a basic overview of what that system would look like as far as components go and what you're going to need for the panel, what you would need for the boil kettle. Obviously, if you have any of the components, then that is going to reduce the cost. Just in a quick kind of comparison to the other two brew in a bag systems that come out of the box from the manufacturer, um, the Grainfather is $890. This is the cheapest thing I found as of January. And $15 to $20 for shipping, depending on where you are. The Braumeister is $1,599 plus shipping, and then you also have to look at converting the system over to uh, from European to American voltage. My system that I'm showing here without a chiller, the reason why I say that is because the grandfather comes with a chiller and we'll discuss a little bit more about that in just a second. Without the counterflow chiller, the system that I have listed here today comes in at $723 for the 10 gallon system and $754 for a 15 gallon system. Now, it is going to require that you do the work as far as building the control panel, building the kettle, all those things. And with the counterflow chiller, both of those systems, the 10 gallon, is $813 and the 15 gallon is $843 with the chiller that I'll show in the listing. Now that those prices don't include shipping or any tax if you're in an area and you buy stuff with tax but as you can see it's certainly just right out of the box with components that I think that will work for sure. There's definitely cheaper components out there as a matter of fact, what I would encourage, if you are watching the video and you know of a source that has cheaper products for anything that I'm showing, please comment below and you know let us know so that we can take a look at the system. I'm sure, I know that there's cheaper ways to build it. I wanted to put together something where I know that the products are available. I know for sure that these products will work for what I'm specifying that they will work for. And there's no other you know modifications or anything necessary other than just building the system to get them to work. So there's cheaper pumps, there's cheaper, there's probably all kinds of cheaper things. You could use a different element with a different heat sink. There's a lot of different things you could do differently. But I wanted to make sure that whenever I listed something, it would be, you, it should work and you shouldn't have any problem with it. So if this video was helpful, please uh, consider subscribing. We're gonna continue to do more of these in the series. I'm kind of wondering where people wanna go next, if they wanna look at a little bit more in depth on this system. Do you wanna do a rim system? Do we wanna go to a Herm system? Let me know in the comments below so I'll know how to proceed with this series. I certainly hope that it helps you. If it does help you, you know, by all means, share it with your friends. Uh, share it with people that you know that are maybe thinking about electric brewing. And let us help you guide them uh, down the path of electric brewing. It's certainly a satisfying uh, hobby for me. I enjoy it a lot and uh, hope that you got something out of it. So until next time, enjoy a beer. We'll see you.